come. And we are uh, celebrating today, uh, next Sunday, and Christmas Eve, this message of Emmanuel, God with us. And uh, our hope and prayer is that uh, today we would take each of the words of Emmanuel, God with us, and talk just about each one of them, that God is today. Next Sunday we'll be with. Christmas Eve we'll talk about us. I know, that's weird on Christmas Eve to talk about us, but you stay tuned, you'll know why. Uh, we're going to share a little bit about us on Christmas Eve. We're looking at Isaiah, uh, two places in Isaiah and one in Matthew where the word Emmanuel is used at all. Uh, only three texts of, of Scripture, three verses of Scripture actually state it, two who talk about it and one who prophesies the fact that that has actually come. Here's the thing about Emmanuel. When all hope is lost, that's exactly when God comes to be with us. And so many of you have stories about Emmanuel being at a spot where you need him to be at a spot in your life. You all have testimonies of this. I, you, you'll say things to this fact. I know that God was with me during that. I knew that God was orchestrating. I knew that God had his hand on that. And every one of you have, and that was, every time you do that, every time you say that, you are saying Emmanuel. I know that sounds weird, like every time you do that is a Christmas moment, but it is. God with us. Hope comes whenever it's lost, and it comes the moment Emmanuel comes. In Matthew, and we'll get to in a second, in Matthew, he has 16 prophetic proofs to fulfill about Jesus. And he's already given us several in the genealogy in the first few verses of Matthew chapter 1, but it's the first formal one that's given when he says that a child will come. He's actually referring back to a text in Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. He's referring to a sign that God said he would give the king of Judah, Ahaz. And in verse 14, it says this, Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign, and the virgin will be with child, and he will give birth to a son and call him Emmanuel. Ahaz was a really, really wicked king. Uh, we know he was wicked. Israel, the northern ten tribes, had attacked Judah and killed 120,000 people in one day. In addition, they had carried around 200,000 people captive, men, women, and children, as their own slaves. Syria was attacked and defeated by one of Judah's fortified cities and taken as captives to the city of Damascus, which we also know about from the New Testament. The prophet Isaiah was telling God that he was not done with Judah, and his promise to date of it was still in effect, and Ahaz would not listen. Get this. Ahaz would not listen. Got anybody like that? The non-listening people? What does it do to get us to not be stubborn to pay attention to our God one more time? Ahaz was told, just listen. Ask God for a sign, Isaiah said. Ask him for a sign, and he'll give you one. A Isaiah two times was asked that by uh, Isaiah, go give him a sign, and, I, and Ahaz, he refused to sign. He gave a pious remark about not tempting God, and Isaiah told him that he was going to give him a sign anyway. Isn't that just like God? You can't tell me what to do. I'm the God of the universe. I can do whatever I want, whenever I want, to whomever I want, for as long as I want. Because he's the king, and I'm not. And he's going to do what's best for us. And so a virgin's going to give birth to a son, and before he can even tell right from wrong, these two kings that were enemies in Judah will be gone, and the child will be referred to as Emmanuel. It sounded utterly impossible to the king. How could weakened Judah survive these powerful enemies only because of divine direction in Emmanuel? You know, there's uh, someone who actually said this, convince a man that there is no hope and he would curse the day he was born. Convince a man that there's no hope and he'll curse the day he was born. Whenever you feel like you're in that spot where you feel like you have no hope, it's Emmanuel who gives us hope. And it's what hope happens. Here's the deal. Emmanuel doesn't come for God's sake. He comes for our sake. And, and humans are the ones who are in need of hope. And it's an indispensable quality. There were years ago, uh, uh, an S-4 submarine was rammed by another ship and it quickly sank to the bottom of the ocean. The entire crew was trapped with inside the vessel. Various ships were in the ocean, rushed to the scene of the disaster, but no one really knew what the crew went through for those few hours underneath the water. Men bravely clung to the oxygen that they could that was inside the sub for as long as they could. Slowly it started to give out. 
One diver came to the rescue, placed his ear to the side of the vessel, and he listened, and there were various tapping noises that were heard. Someone was tapping from inside the submarine. It was Morse code. And as Morse code, this is what was being tapped. Is there any hope? Is there any hope? Is there any hope? It's the cry of humanity. All of humanity is crying, is there any hope? Is there any what is, why are we here? What is this for? Why do we have to go through these struggles we go through? What do we, what do, we do with direction? And what do we do with leadership? And what do, we, what do we do when we're feeling hopeless? Hopeless from the hospital? Sitting in that room waiting for them to come and tell you the news? Hopeless waiting by the mailbox for some bill to come that you might not be able to pay? Hopeless in the drug rehab center? Hopeless in that place that you call work or school. When all humanity knows that there's this place where I'm just doing everything I can and I just don't feel like you're here. I just want to breathe some hope in you today. And it's not going to be anything I'm going to say except this, Emmanuel. God with us. Hope is found as soon as God shows up. The moment he appears on the planet, everybody is able to go, oh, Emmanuel's here. You know, it's that moment that you have, the same moment that you have that you go, I know God's with me in this. The moment you go, I'm going to be okay. Whatever it is you say, that's Emmanuel. God with you. And all it takes is for him to show up to bring hope. In one of the most interesting cemeteries, if you're interested in cemeteries, is in London, uh, in Bunsfield, Bunsfield Field. It's a place where many famous people were buried. Charles Wesley is buried there. Isaac Watts, great hymn writer, is buried there. Daniel Defoe, author of Robinson Crusoe. But opposite of the great graveyard is a chapel of John Wesley. And a, a mom, uh, there's a monument erected to him. And across the road is John Wesley's house, where on March the 2nd, 1791, Wesley opened his eyes and exclaimed for the very last time on his deathbed these words, the best of all of this is God is with us. What would make a man at his deathbed speak out one more time, Emmanuel, before he leaves the planet? Because he knows that even in the moment of sorrow and even in the moment he can't control the last breath he's going to take, that it's at least God was with me. And Christmas is welcoming the God of the universe who came down to be with us. And when you understand Emmanuel, you get God concentrated. Now, I'll tell you what that means in a second, but let's look at this text in Matthew. <coughs> in Matthew, it says this. Joseph had a dream. Verse 21, it says this said that she will give birth to a son and you will give him the name Jesus because he will save the people from their sins. And all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will be with child, will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him, took Mary home as his wife, but he had no union with her until she gave birth to a son and he gave him the name Jesus. Two names in one little text. God concentrate. You ever heard something being made from concentrate before? Concentrate means this, to make something stronger, denser, and more focused. One of the greatest places that I think that we see concentrate or made from concentrate is that frozen can of orange juice. Still use those? Yeah. Frozen can of orange juice, you take off the lid, and inside is this what seems to be orange juice, but concentrate it. What needs to happen with concentrated orange juice is it needs some water added to it. Now, for me, whenever I was a kid and mom said, go make some orange juice, that was like a popsicle moment to me. I mean, you just like it's a push pop. You just shove this thing up and it just keeps coming. And so our orange juice didn't always taste the way it needed to. One, because I had my mouth on it beforehand, but the other is I'd probably chopped off a good quarter of it before I put it in a little jug. 
concentrated orange juice. But here's the beauty of orange juice. When you add water to it, it now becomes something everyone can have. And when I think about Christ Jesus coming as Emmanuel, the living water, Jesus, comes in and concentrates what God's got going on, and there's enough to serve for everybody, and all of us get to enjoy the sweetness of his coming. God concentrated. And here's the concentrated part out of the text of God's word. I'm going to rattle off a bunch of scriptures. They're not in your thing. Write them down if you want. But these are the things that help me to understand God is a manual concentrated. Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6. For to us a child is born. To us a son is given. The government will be on his shoulders. And he'll be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Colossians chapter 1 verse 15. The son is the image of of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3, the Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of His being, sustaining all things by His powerful word. John chapter 1 verse 1 says it this way, in the beginning was the word and the word was God and, or the word was with God and the word was God. John chapter 1 verse 14, just a few verses down from that, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. John's referring to Emmanuel. John chapter 1, verse 18. No, no one has seen God, no one has ever seen God, but the one and only Son who is himself God, as in the closest relationship with the Father, has made him known. And then this one in John chapter 14. Later on, at the end of Jesus' life, he's getting ready to go to the cross. One of his own disciples, Philip, asked the question, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. <laughs> Jesus answered, don't you know me, Philip? Even after I've been among you for such a long time, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Emmanuel is concentrated. How so? Well, we know that, we know that because Jesus comes as God. I want to begin to look at some of the names of God in the Old Testament, and they came up with the declarations about Jesus in the New Testament. It became more and more evident about the deity of Jesus Christ being God. For example, God is called in the Old Testament Elohim, the Creator. In the New Testament, Jesus says that everything was created was created by Christ Jesus. In the Old Testament, God is called Jehovah, the I Am. Jesus says to the Jews, "Before Abraham was, I am." In the Old Testament, God is called Adonai, which means the boss. In the New Testament, in the Bible, it says we must confess Jesus as Lord or our boss. In the Old Testament, he's called Jehovah Nissi, your banner of victory. In the New Testament, Jesus says, I have overcome the world. In the Old Testament, God is called Jehovah Rai, the Lord is my shepherd. In the New Testament, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd, and the sheep hear my voice. In the Old Testament, God is called Jehovah Sabbath. He is the Lord of hosts. In the New Testament, Jesus says, I have come. I could call 10,000 angels. In the Old Testament, God is called El Elyon. The Lord is high and mighty. In the New Testament, Jesus says, I sit on the right hand of the Father way up high. In the Old Testament, God is called El Shaddai. And in Revelation chapter 1, verse 8, the Bible says, Jesus Christ is Lord Almighty. You can get confused about the name of God. All you got to do is remember Emmanuel. Can't remember all those names. Can't say all those names. You come up with the one that's concentrated, that has them all. Because we also know that Jesus was, came as a man. During Jesus' 33 years on earth, he went through every category of situation you now face. He went through loneliness. He went through being forsaken. He went through being rejected. He went through being crucified. He went through death. He even went through... Crying. Everything. Everything that you ever talk about. You can't say he doesn't understand what I'm going through. Now that would be the with part, and we'll talk about that next week. But Jesus came as a man. It's not some movie that we're watching. This is who he is. He came to be flesh and blood and live among us as a man. And Jesus changes from moment to moment. We see it throughout Scripture from being man to God, from God to man. Back and forth he goes. One moment Jesus is hungry, and the next moment he's feeding 5,000 with fish and bread. One moment he's thirsty. The next moment he's walking on the very water he's thirsty for. One moment he's growing in knowledge. 
teaching the people in the temple at 12, and the next moment, he knows exactly what they're thinking. One moment, he cries over a friend who's just died, and the next moment, he raises that same friend from the dead. One moment, he, is, he calls himself the Son of Man, and one moment, he calls himself the Son of God. One moment, he dies on the cross and bleeds, and another moment, he conquers death and lives again after three days. There was never a book written by Jesus, and yet he's spoken about by one, one of the most printed books of all times. More people write and write about him than anyone. He never wrote a song, and yet all the songs are written and sung to him and about him all the time. He never, never traveled more than 300 miles away from his own home, but the message that he had and what he did is said and talked about all over the world. Emmanuel, God with us. The big idea is that we know Jesus that he's man-made from concentration of God himself. And all of the names of God, however many you want to count today, it depends on what book you read and what site you go to, on how many names of God there are, but whatever names there are and whatever names you can't say because it's got about a Jehovah and a bunch of L stuff in it, and it's the kind of Hebrew stuff to you, I want you to put all the names in the concentrated name of Emmanuel. He owns them all. There's an old, old commercial I wanted to share with you, there's several of them that got made in the late 80s and early 90s by Prego, spaghetti sauce. And in the spaghetti sauce commercial, it was the first time we were actually hearing about a jar of spaghetti sauce that you could go and purchase instead of making. And so people would be gathering around the kitchen and they're cooking up their spaghetti sauce and the kid comes home from college and he says, hey, come home. And they're all talking Italian, of course. Mom and dad are making spaghetti. This is awesome. Homemade spaghetti. No, son, it's not spaghetti that we're homemade. It's from a jar. What? Making spaghetti from a jar? That's unheard of. What about all of the garlic? And they would say, it's in there. Well, what about all the onions? It's in there. What about all the herbs and spices? I'm telling you, it's in there. And then they'd raise up a little thing and stick it in their mouth. And they'd go, yeah, it's in there. Can I tell you about Emmanuel? It's in there. It's in there. You want, you want provision? It's in there. You need help with loneliness? It's in there. You need redemption? It's in there. You need forgiveness? It's in there. You need someone who will hear you? It's in there. <clears throat> Jesus is the creator and forgiver, redeemer, healer, sovereign, Lord of lords, the lover of our souls, compassionate friend of sinners, provider for all of that's for us. Emmanuel, God with us. God became one of us as Emmanuel. And as he came at Christmas time, he wasn't wrapped with wrapping paper, but with skin. God with skin on. Hebrews 1, 3, again, the sun is the radiance of God's glory, the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things. Coloss Colossians chapter 2, verse 9. For in Christ, all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. God chose to become us. Why? You are God. What, what business would you have wanting to experience anything that we have here could we have not told god in advance you really don't want to come and do this like this is not going to be fun for you to put skin on and have to do what you did here but god chose wrapping paper called skin how did he become one of us well a reminder he jesus emmanuel is fully god i know i've already said that but i want to make sure you hear it Philippians chapter 2, verse 6 says it this way, who being in the very nature of God did not consider equality with God something to be used for his own advantage. Paul is telling us that Jesus is the very nature of God. The Greek word for nature can also be the word for formed. The Son of God was equal. He was formed. He was an exact replica, one in nature, one in attributes, one in character with the Father. John chapter 10, verse 30 says it this way, I and the Father are one. This is what Jesus says about himself. The leaders began to pick up stones when he said those words. They were ready to kill him because he was saying something blasphemous. He was saying, I am God. Okay, stones are coming now. We're raising up and we're ready to go. He knew by saying these words, it would cause a little division among them. That this would be the reason that they would end up taking him to the cross. Because he was sharing blasphemous words. But there was, this was the thing about Jesus. He, he knew that they would startle them, but he's about the plain truth. 
He's just going to tell you what he thinks. What he's, he's going to call it as he sees it. It's not he's going to come across fun to us or, ooh, I like those words, but he's just going to say the truth. It's a simple truth. And just so we're clear, this verse in John 10, 30 is the clearest statement you'll ever have on the deity of who Jesus is in Scripture. I and the Father are one. Man, you got it. But we also, Jesus Emmanuel is fully man. Philippians chapter 2, verse 6 and 7 says, who being in the very nature of God did not consider equality with God something to be used for his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness. Jesus made himself nothing. Now that makes it sound like they downplayed himself. Like, you know, I'm just a jerk. He didn't do that. How can he make himself nothing? Nothing. This is actually what happened. He emptied himself. Well, what, would, what, what did he have there that he emptied? I would say it's his glory. See, as God, he could have just like, he could have showed up and done the whole, every time he pointed, light would come out of his finger, and every time he spoke, like, wow, he'd like, set things on fire. Because he's full of glory, he could have done that. But instead, he emptied himself of his glory and said, I'm just going to serve you. I'm just going to love you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to serve you. He washes the disciples' feet. And then says, now go and do what I've just done to you. He made himself nothing. He takes on the cross. He was born in Bethlehem. <clears throat> Big deal, Bethlehem. Born in Bethlehem, why? Because he knew he was going to die for us. Calvary. He made himself nothing. But Jesus Emmanuel, becoming one with us, makes his home in us as well. John 14, verse 23 says that Jesus replied, anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My Father will love them, and he will come to them and make our home with them. I love how he changed to the pronoun parts right there. At first, he's just talking about my Father, and the next thing he says, we'll make our home with them. All of a sudden, it was me, and now it's us. He wants to come and live inside of us. Phyllis Moore this morning was baptized in the Christ. We say that she received the gift of the Holy Spirit. I have to tell you, afterwards, first off, before we even got in, 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 in the baptistry, we're in the back crying and celebrating over what God's doing in her. She can't believe that she's here. She's a nervous wreck about getting in the water. She's 71 years old and had waited this long to get baptized. All of her friends and her family are here, and she just doesn't want to go in. In fact, she got dressed and stayed back there the whole time. She didn't want to come out here at all. We go out there, and, and we get done, and when we get back out of the baptistry, she's crying again, and she said, I did it. I did it. She recognizes that she's not by herself anymore. Christ Jesus comes into a city, and they find out there is no vacancy for the family. Sorry, no room in the inn. You'll have to take another spot somewhere else. We're going to go and have you birth out here in a stable and the reality of all of that, born in a manger, Christ Jesus now finds vacancy inside of us. And he says, I want to reside in you. I want to take ownership and live where you are. And that means that wherever you go, he goes. Whatever you say, he says. Well, however you act and however you treat, that's how you represent him. Because he wants to dwell in us. We also see that Jesus Emmanuel wants to be with us. Revelation chapter 21, verses 3 and 4. I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them, and he will be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death, no more mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things are passed away. Emmanuel came to live with us. He walked with us. He talked with us. He cried and laughed and stood and sat and drank and ate and hung out with us. And for 33 years, he called earth his home, and that means God isn't distant anymore. He's not some far off, oh yeah, I think the God of the universe is really out there. No, he is with us as Emmanuel. He came near to us. Mercy Me put out a song that they called God with us. You, many of you know this and would sing along probably as I'm saying the words to you, but here are the words to at least one part of that verse. God with us, he said, who are we that you would be mindful of us? What do you see? What's worth looking our way? We are free in ways that we never should be. Sweet release from the grip of these chains. Like hinges straining from the weight, my heart no longer can keep from singing. All that is within me cries, for you alone be glorified, Emmanuel, God with us. 
My heart sings a brand new song. My debt is paid. These chains are gone. Emmanuel, God with us. That is the heart cry because he hangs out with us. And then this last piece, Jesus Emmanuel becomes our substitute. John 3, 16 and 17, many of us know. For God so loved the world, you, that he gave his one and only son, Emmanuel, that whoever believes in him will not perish or die, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. God doesn't want us to perish. And so he sends Emmanuel to go and die in our place so that we could be with him forever. 1 John chapter 2, verses 2 and 3 says it this way. My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anybody does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins and not for ours alone but also for the sins of the world. Emmanuel steps into our place to give life to those who would have received death, a substitute. Our team's going to come here in a minute, and uh, I want to close by by sharing this last little story and and one more text of Scripture as they come. What do you think the name Emmanuel meant to Matthew? I mean, the first time he's actually writing it. Like he knows what it said in the Old Testament in Isaiah 7 and 8 and the fact that those two places were the, were the two places the manual was actually mentioned. But what does Emmanuel mean to Matthew? More importantly, what does Emmanuel mean to the Jewish people? Better question. What does Emmanuel mean to you? An artist once drew a picture. Are they on the stage? Can we hit the light? Uh, they can see. An artist once drew a picture, and I want you to help picture this in your head with me. I don't have it on the screen for you. An artist drew a picture of winter twilight. Trees within the picture were heavily laden with snow. There was a dreary, dark house in the background that looked lonely and desolate. And right there, in the midst of the storm, they all could see that it was a dark black house shadowed with the silhouette of these trees. A sad picture. But then a quick stroke, just one quick stroke with a yellow crayon, and the artist simply put a streak of light coming from the window. The effect was transforming. It was magical because the entire scene was translated into a vision of comfort, a vision of cheer. I want you to hear this morning that the name Emmanuel meant to Matthew what it meant to God's people at this time. There was a streak of light in the dark world. Christ Jesus had made himself known that he was here now. Emmanuel became light in the middle of darkness. And as the light came out, the light started to shine on the one who was to come. Emmanuel is welcome. God with us has come. He's made himself known We don't live in a dark world anymore. And from that, we take the light. Tom, would you take this light? Here it comes. Now, we have Emmanuel with us. And wherever we go with Emmanuel, the light is what we want everyone to see. That we want Emmanuel to be known, that he's welcome wherever it is we go. And whatever tragedy or trial we face, Emmanuel goes with us. So whether we're high or whether we're low, Emmanuel's going to go wherever we're at. We have God with us who's restored us. Thank you for sharing that light with me. You can turn the light back on for the people who are panicking right now. John chapter 3, after John 3.16, John 3.19 says this. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world. People love darkness instead of light because their deeds were full of evil. Everyone who hates the light will not come to the light for their fear their deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that they may plainly see what they have done has been done in the sight of God. See, when Emmanuel comes, I just want to tell you this, it flat out means hope has come. And every time you struggle with whatever burden you carry and with whatever struggle you've got going on, whatever hospital visit you need to make, whatever kid's giving you problems right now, I want you to know you step into the word Emmanuel every time you know, I know God's got this. I know he's got it. Because every time he flat out brings hope when we don't have it. And a lot of times Christmas represents presents that we receive, gifts that we're going to get. But I want you to know that Christmas is God's presence with us. 
in the name Emmanuel. He comes to live with us. God with us. God with us. And I want you to know that if you don't know him as your Savior, if you've not called him as your Lord, if you've not had yourself cleansed by the waters of Christian baptism, I want to offer it to you one more time. Phyllis waited until she was 71 years old, and she said, for the last 50 years, I can't believe that I knew this information, and I waited, and I waited, and I waited. But she said today, I'm so glad I did it today. And I want that to be you. If you don't have a home, a Christian home, a place where you can call a fellowship with other believers in Christ Jesus who are wandering and maneuvering through this journey together because we have Emmanuel with us, this is that moment when you can come. We're going to sing one more time, and if you'd like to make a decision, I'll be here to receive you today. Let's stand.